Welcome back to Fundamentals of DC Circuits. In this video, we will be discussing the node voltage method. And the learning objective for this video is that you will be able to understand and apply the node voltage method to find an unknown quantity in a circuit. In the previous videos, we discussed the branch current and loop current methods. And those methods can be used to find a branch current in a circuit like the one shown below. The node voltage method is just a third option you have to analyze a circuit like this. So you can use branch current or loop current to accomplish the same thing that the node voltage method does. On the screen, you'll see a summary of the steps you have to take to use the node voltage method. When you're done, you will have equations that will allow you to solve for unknown quantities within this circuit, such as the current through a resistor or the voltage at a specific point. So to use the node voltage method, first you have to determine the number of nodes. As you can see with the diagram on the right, the nodes are labeled. You're going to select one node as a reference. The reference node is always going to be where ground would be located. In this particular example on the screen, that's where node B is. That's where your ground terminal would be connected because that's where all of your current returns to the path uh, it originated from. So ground is always going to be that reference node when we apply the node voltage method. Third, you're going to assign a current at each node where the voltage is unknown, except at the reference node. So for this example on the right, we basically have node A where we do not know the voltage at this point we have a current that is assigned for node A, showing the current going in here, a current going in here, and a current coming out of there. When you assign the current, the direction is arbitrarily picked, so you can take your best guess as to which way you think the current flows. If it turns out that your answer is negative, it just means that your assumption was incorrect and that current is actually going to flow in the opposite direction than what you picked. After you assign the currents at each node, you're going to apply KCL at each node to get an equation to relate those currents together. And then here's where node voltage is different from branch current and loop current method. We're going to express each current in terms of a voltage. In the other two methods, we had voltages that we expressed in terms of current. We took a voltage and wrote it out as I times R. The node voltage method is reverse. We're going to take a current and write it out in terms of a voltage, which would be V over R. And then we'll have a system of equations that we can then solve. So let's look at some examples. We're gonna begin by using the node voltage method to find the voltage VA and the currents I1, I2, and I3 below. The voltage VA is this node right here. This is going to be VA. So I'll go ahead and label that. And this current right here, that's I1 because it goes through resistor 1. This one here is I2. And this one here will be I3. So we're going to find the voltage at VA as well as each branch current using the node voltage method. Again, here's a summary of the steps we're going to complete. Assign currents at each node, <clears throat> which has been done. We have I1, I2, and I3. Our reference node is going to be this node right here, which would be ground. We're going to apply KCL to each node and express each current in terms of a voltage to solve it. So first, we're going to take a look at the currents, I1, I2, and I3. If I had to express the current flowing through resistor 1 in terms of a voltage, I have to express that voltage as a difference between uh, two points. The current through R1 can be described by writing the voltage over R1 divided by R1. Now remember that every resistor has a voltage drop across it. 
a voltage drop is just a difference in voltage between two points. So the voltage for R1 can be described as the difference between the voltage here and the voltage here. If I take Vs1 and subtract whatever the voltage happens to be at this point in the circuit, that's the voltage drop that we see across R1. So when I write an equation for I1 in terms of a voltage divided by a resistance, the voltage has to be the voltage across R1. That voltage drop is going to be the difference in voltage between Vs1 and Va. One way to think about this is that the voltage drop is going to be the difference in voltage from where the current started and where the current met a node. So if you look at our equation right here for I1, I'm writing that current in terms of V over R, where V is the voltage drop across R1. That voltage drop can be described as the difference in voltage between where the current started and where it met a node. So that difference in voltage is Vs1 minus Va, and on the bottom of our equation, we have R1. This is what we mean when we say to express each current in terms of voltages. So now let's take a look at I2. I2 is going to be the voltage for resistor 2 divided by resistor 2. In this case, that voltage drop is going to be from Va to ground. So our equation for I2 is going to be technically Va minus 0. Since Va minus 0 is Va, the minus 0 is not shown here. But this is our equation for I2. The current through resistor 2 is going to be Va minus ground over R2. And then take a look at the current for I3. Since we decided that I3 is going to flow this way, the voltage for R3 is going to be the difference between Vs2 and Va. If this arrow were pointing in the opposite direction, your equation here would have the numerator flipped around where it would say Va minus Vs2. So you will follow the direction of your current flow when you write each current in terms of a voltage. So each one of these currents is now in terms of a voltage using Ohm's law. Next, we can apply KCL to the node VA. We can see that I1 plus I3 would equal I2 according to KCL. Now that we have these equations, we're going to start to use some algebra to begin to solve. So here's a recap of these two equations. The next thing that we're going to do is take our equation from the KCL at node A, and we are going to replace I1, I2, and I3 with their equivalent equations that we've derived right here. Basically, we're going to take each equation that explains the current in terms of a voltage and replace them right here. So when I make that replacement, here is the equation that I'll have, where each current is now replaced with this equivalent written out in terms of a voltage drop divided by a resistance. Now I have one thing that I don't know, which is VA. I can fill in everything else that I know, which includes both source voltages and all the resistance levels. Keep in mind that the resistors are given in ohms and kilo ohms. For consistency, you will want to pick one unit and write everything with the same unit. So you'll see in my equation that I've written everything in kilo ohms along the bottom. Now that we have this equation, we can see that VA is the only thing missing. So we need to use some algebra to solve this equation for VA. Here's how that's going to work. We're going to begin by taking the first fraction and multiplying the top and the bottom by the denominator of the second fraction. Here's what that'll look like right here. We're also gonna take the second fraction and multiply the top and the bottom by the denominator from the first fraction. That's this piece right here. What that does is create a common denominator where both fractions will have the same denominator. That'll allow me to combine these two fractions together and then continue solving for VA. So when I make a simplification, here's what I have next, showing that common denominator. In the next step, what I'm going to do is combine the fractions and then eliminate the denominator completely 
by multiplying both sides by 0.183. That leaves me with this equation right here. Again, I will repeat what I did. I combined the two fractions together to give me one fraction with one denominator, and then I multiplied both sides by that denominator to cancel it out of the left side. So what's left is this equation right here, which I can use some basic algebra to solve and find VA. VA comes out to be 7.45 volts. Now that I have VA, I can very easily go back and find I1, I2, and I3 by plugging VA into each equation for each branch current right here. So I1, I2, and I3 come out to be these values by plugging that, plugging that value of VA in. Notice that I3 came out to be negative. This is okay. There's nothing wrong with that. All it means is that when we assumed the current through R3 flows this way, our assumption was incorrect and current is actually flowing in the opposite direction. This does not mean that you have to redo the problem or start over by changing that arrow. All it means is that when you go forward with all of the calculations that you've done, you need to remember that the calculation you have for um, the current through R3 is going to go, the current is going to flow in the opposite direction than what you picked. That's all it means. So um, we found VA, we found all three branch currents, and at this point, our work is done. A great practice tool for this problem would be to go and solve it using the loop current and branch current methods and make sure you get the same answers that are shown on the screen. That's a great way to practice the other methods and see that they are equivalent. Moving on to the next problem, we are now going to analyze a Wheatstone bridge. We're going to find the voltages at node B and node C. Keep in mind that node D is the reference node, and node A has the same voltage as the source. So we already know the voltage for node A. We're just going to solve this to find the voltage for node B and node C. Now you have seen uh, the same bridge circuit before. We've solved this using a Thevenin equivalent, and we've also solved this using a delta to Y conversion. So the node voltage method is now a third tool you will have in your tool belt to solve a bridge circuit like the one shown. All three of those methods are equivalent. They'll all lead you to the same answer. Um, when choosing a certain method, it'll be up to you to decide what you're going to use based on the needs of the problem. So we're going to go forward and solve this bridge circuit using the node voltage method. To begin, we're going to look at node B. If I look at the current flow, for node B, I can assume that current will flow out of the voltage source, come to node A and split. Some will go this way. I don't know which direction the current will flow through RL, so I'm going to make an assumption. I'm just going to assume it flows this way. Remember at the end, my answer for this current will tell me whether my assumption was right. So whenever you don't know, just pick a direction blindly. You don't have to worry about choosing wrong. So I'm going to assume that IL flows to the left, and I'm going to assume that the current through R2 flows down. So if I were to do a KCL at node B based on these assumptions, here's what it would look like. Remember, I1 means the current through R1, IL means the current through RL, etc. Now that I have my KCL equation, I'm going to replace each current by writing it in terms of a voltage drop divided by resistance. I1 would be the voltage drop from point A to point B divided by R1. IL will be the voltage drop from point C to point B divided by RL. And I2 would be the voltage drop from point B to D, which is ground. So that's basically voltage at point B minus nothing divided by R2. Now that I have this equation, I'm going to plug in everything that I currently know. I know that VA is 12. I know all the resistor values. So I'm going to fill that in, remembering to use consistent units. So everything is written in kilo ohms. From this point forward, I'm going to need to use some algebra to simplify this equation. Notice that I have two things I don't know, VB and VC. 
So I'm going to simplify this equation and then move forward to figure out a second equation to give me a relationship between these two variables. I can't solve this problem until I have two equations to relate the two things that I don't know. So right now we're going to simplify this and this will become our first equation. To simplify this, we're going to multiply each term in the equation by a combination of a, the product of the denominators. This will cause all the denominators to cancel out, and I'll show you what that means. Here's our equation. We're going to multiply each term by R1 times R2 times RL, and here's what that'll look like. I'm going to take all three denominators and multiply them together right here, and then I'm going to take that combination and multiply it by each term in the equation. All three terms, here, here, and here, they're all getting multiplied essentially by the same value. What's going to, what that's going to do is cause your denominators to cancel. Look at the first fraction. This will cancel that. This will cancel that. This will cancel that. And then I can simplify, and I no longer have to worry about dealing with fractions. When I simplify, here's what I get. I'm going to simplify this one step further using algebra and combine like terms so that I get a final equation shown here. This is now equation one. I need two equations because I have two things I don't know. So I'm going to have to go back to the circuit now and figure out how to derive a second equation that I can use to solve this problem. But we do have equation one right now. So we'll go back to the circuit, and now we're going to look at node C. Because we have two nodes we're analyzing, we just analyzed node B. We're now going to analyze node C. I'm going to make some assumptions about the direction of current flow. I'm going to assume R3 has a current that flows this way. We've already made the assumption that IL flows that way. Stick with that assumption. You've already made it. Don't change it now. And then we're going to assume the current through R4 flows that way, which means my KCL equation would look like this. I3 equals IL plus I4. Next, replace each current and write it out in terms of a voltage drop divided by a resistance. I3 would be VA minus Vc divided by R3. Remember, for each voltage drop, look where the current begins and look at where it hits a node. That's going to be your difference in voltage. And then you're simply going to divide that by a resistance to get that current value. IL will be Vc minus Vb divided by RL. And I4 will be Vc minus ground or nothing divided by R4. Now that I have this equation, I'm going to plug in what I know. I know VA and I know all the resistor values. Remember to use consistent units. So everything is written in kilo ohms. And I'm going to do the same thing that I did for node B. I'm going to multiply each term by a product of all three denominators. So here's what that will look like. Each term in the equation is going to be multiplied by a product of all three denominators. We do this to cancel out the fractions. This will cancel. And this will cancel. Once you simplify that, here's what's left. And then you're going to use some algebra to distribute, combine like terms, etc., and simplify it further. Once you do that, here's what you'll end up with. And now I have equation two. I have two things I don't know and two equations, and now I can go about solving for VB and VC. So here are my two equations. You can use algebra to solve this like we've shown in previous problems, but I'm going to show you another way, which is the determinant method. This method is based on the fact that these equations form a matrix, a two by two matrix. We have two things we don't know and two equations that relate them together, so we can use a matrix to solve this. The first thing you're going to do is label each coefficient 
in your equation, and they must be labeled exactly as you see on the screen. And we are going to use these labels to refer to the coefficient or that big, large number in front of your variable. So you're going to label each coefficient as shown on the screen. And the next thing you're going to do to use this method is to calculate what we call the characteristic determinant, which is equal to A times D minus B times C. Keep in mind that if there is a negative sign in front of a particular coefficient, you need to include that in your calculation when you type this into your calculator. So be sure that you're doing these calculations along with me and getting the same numbers in your calculator that you see on the screen. So once you find the characteristic determinant, which again is A times D minus B times C, it's a very, very large number. That's okay. You should get this number you see on the screen. The next step you're going to do is to calculate VB, and this is the formula you can use to calculate VB. Remember, you have to label your equations with the coefficients the same way that I've labeled mine. And this equation right here basically tells you how to find whatever is the first variable in your equations. So this might say VA and might say X or Y, no matter what the variable name is, this equation here tells you how to find the first variable in your set of equations. And remember, when you write these out, your variables should line up, VB and VB, VC and VC. So to calculate VB, we're going to do D times E minus B times F. Notice that it makes a cross or a box here. That goes on the top of your fraction, and the characteristic determinant goes on the bottom. You're going to divide those two, and that's going to give you your value for VB. The formula for VC, notice now we're solving for the second variable. It's also going to form an X. A times F minus C times E. You're going to make that calculation and then divide by the characteristic determinant again to get your value for VC. And that is how you use the determinant method to solve a system of equations. So once again, you could solve this using algebra if you want to, or you can use this method. They both are equivalent and both will lead you to the final answers for VB and VC. And that's the end of this problem. Moving on to the next problem, we're gonna use the node voltage method to determine the voltage at point A, as well as the branch currents I1 and I2. Remember, for extra practice, you can go back and solve this problem using the branch current and the loop current methods and compare your results. You should get the same answer all three times. So to begin, we have one node we're going to analyze, which is right here. If I look at the current going into this node, I can assume I have a current going here. I can assume I have a current going here. And I know this current going here. So KCL at this node would have to be I1 minus I2 equals 100 milliamps. I'm now going to write I1 and I2 in terms of a voltage drop divided by resistance. I1 will become 12 minus VA divided by 47 ohms. I2 will be the voltage at point A minus nothing, divided by 100 ohms. Notice I have one equation and one thing I don't know, so from here on out, I can just use algebra to solve for VA. Here's what that algebra would look like. We're going to use the same technique as before, where we multiply this fraction, top and bottom, by 100, multiply this fraction, top and bottom, by 47, in order to cancel out the denominators. That'll first give you a common denominator, and then you can multiply both sides by that common denominator to cancel it out. Afterwards, you're going to distribute, combine like terms, and solve for VA. So I have VA. That was the first part of the problem. The other part is that you're solving for the branch currents I1 and I2. Keep in mind, to solve for I1, we simply can use this piece of our equation right here. To solve for I2, we can use this piece of our equation because this represents I1 and this represents I2. 
So you're going to take VA and plug it in to this piece of the equation to find I1, plug it in here to find I2. There's I1, and there's I2. And we can easily see that our results make sense. If 150 milliamps goes into the node and approximately 50 goes that way, then 100 should be going that way. So our results do make sense. For our final problem in this video, we're going to solve for the voltage across the load resistor using the node voltage method. Take a look at what we have on the screen. We've got five resistors. One of them is the load. We're going to be using node analysis to find the voltage across the load. To begin, we're going to start with node B. We don't need to start with node A because node A is connected to the 12 volt source. So we know the voltage at node A. When you're doing the node voltage method, begin by looking at a node for which you don't know the voltage. So we don't need to worry about node A. We already know what that voltage is. Keep in mind, node D is the reference, so we also know that that is your ground. So we just need to look at node B and node C. I'm going to make an assumption that current goes this way and splits, so that some current goes this way and some current goes that way. And some current goes that way. So if I go with those assumptions, that would mean that a KCL at node B would give me that the current through R2 is equal to the current through R3 plus the current through R4. Rewrite each one of those currents as a difference in voltage divided by resistance, and here's what you'll get. I2 is VA minus VB over R2. I3 is VB minus VC over R3. I4 is VB minus nothing over R4. Fill in what you know. We know VA and we know all the resistor values. Next, we're going to do the same process that was shown in the problem with the Wheatstone bridge, where we multiply the entire equation, each term in that equation, by a product of all three denominators. So we're going to repeat that process again here. Here's our equation. Here's what we're going to do. Here's what it'll look like. And these denominators will cancel. And you're going to simplify this. This is now your equation with all those denominators canceled out. You're going to use algebra to distribute and combine like terms and get it even simpler. Here's your equation. Even though I'm not showing every single step of the algebra on the screen, you should be able to do that algebra on your own, and that should be reflected in your notes, suggested problems, quiz problems, exam problems, etc. cetera. Uh, the algebra skills are skills that you will have gotten in the math for electronics engineering course or college algebra. If this is a weak spot for you, it's just something that you'll need to practice outside of class so that you can be able to solve these problems. If you're having trouble figuring out how to simplify something on your own, you're always welcome to ask questions in class, post a question on the discussion board, or drop by office hours. So moving on, that's our equ equation one. Remember, we need two equations because we have two things that we don't know. So we're going to go back to the circuit. We're now going to analyze node C and we're going to come up with that second equation we need. For node C, we've already made the assumption that this current flows this way. I'm going to assume current flows this way, and I'm going to assume the load current flows out. That means my KCL has to be I1 plus I3 equals the load current. Replace each current so that it is written in terms of a voltage drop divided by resistance and then fill in what you know. And then we're going to repeat the same process by multiplying by a product of the denominators to cancel the denominators out completely. So here's our equation. 
here's what you're what we're doing. Here's what it will look like. Where our denominators will cancel out. From here, you will use algebra to simplify. Now we have our second equation. This is equation two. And now we have two things that we don't know and two equations. We can go about solving for each of them using the determinant method. Oops, sorry, there's my equations. Using the determinant method. So there's our two equations. There's each coefficient labeled. Remember, you have to label it exactly as shown on the screen. You have to line up your variables so that you have them in the same order for both equations. And then you're going to calculate the characteristic determinant, which is a times d minus b times c. And then define each individual variable. Follow the formulas shown on the screen. That gives you vb and vc. Now keep in mind the question was to solve for the voltage across the load resistor. In this case, you found VB and VC. Make sure you can translate that back to what you were originally asked to find. In this case, the voltage across the load resistor is the voltage VC. So we've answered the problem by finding VC. And that will conclude our examples for studying the node voltage method. We will spend time in class practicing some of these methods and um, look online for the suggested problems so that you can get additional circuits to practice with. Again, it's a great idea to try to use several methods whenever you can. Um, a, a circuit like this, if you were doing the loop current method, requires three loops, which means you need three equations and three things you don't know. We did not discuss how to solve a matrix with three variables, but it is covered in the textbook if you'd like to take a look. Otherwise, you can use algebra to solve. So keep practicing these and bring your questions to class so that we can go over it. And that is the end of this video.